welcome. You're with our special coverage here. Good morning. You're with our special coverage on the booster dose budget, a budget that is the 10th budget of the Narendra Modi government, the third in the shadow of COVID. And there's plenty to look forward to because this time we're combining the power of India today with the power of business today. Now, so two marquee brands getting together. Uh, to power the business coverage. I want to go across this morning to Udayan Mukherjee joining us uh, from London where it is a very unearthly hour. Udayan, good morning. Nice to see you. Bright and chirpy on budget morning. Who said I'm bright and chirpy? This We're is trying a facade, to pump Rahul. you up. Just pump you up it's and get you going. in the morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, a good budget may just get me going, yeah, but good morning to all of you. It's wonderful to be joining you from here. Fantastic. Okay. You, you mentioned good budget. I just wanted to get a sense from you. What, according to you then, makes a good budget? What is that budget uh, that, what is the defining characteristic of a budget that makes it a good budget? Well, this time around, uh, Rajdeep, uh, I would say that all the people who will float through our studios today uh, from morning to evening probably need this budget the least because corporate India has actually had it the best uh, in years. Um, they're doing quite well now. Earnings are recovering. Uh, I think demand is pretty strong. Exports have recovered. And I think after a long time, there is a fairly virtuous cycle for corporate India, the kind of guests who will talk to a lot through the course of the day. I don't think the budget is required for them beyond the point. So I would say in my book, the budget should do just two or three things. One, of course, rev up the CapEx uh, budget for next year, the capital expenditure budget for next year by 25, 30%, because that has a multiplier effect that creates jobs and that needs to be done. Doing that, the government needs to spend all the unutilized cash on the CapEx front quickly, because we need to get that out of the gate. Mm -hmm. Once that is done, you focus on the fiscal deficit a little bit because we need to show the world that we are getting back to a pa path of fiscal consolidation. So if the fiscal deficit is 6.8% this year, we need to show that we are going to 6.3 or 6.4% next year. That will generally be liked and cheered by all. So CapEx, fiscal deficit, and once these two are done, focus all your time, energy, and resources on the bottom end of the pyramid. That is where India's problem is. It is not with cor the corporate sector. It is not with the stock market. These two clusters need the finance minister the least this year. Where we are needed, where the finance resources are needed, is really at the bottom end because we have a very big problem out there. This K-shaped thing cannot last beyond the point. So I would say, a budget which would please me is a budget which does not necessarily please all our uh, studio experts today uh, from the corporate sector, but people who are not there in the studios uh, who are uh, the marginalized and the lower end of the pyramid. Interesting. The, the alphabet has changed from V to K. Uh, but Sanjeev a... Sanyal yesterday mm -hmm. used the letter W. He said the best man's mind sat together. W indicating a sharp bounce back, another fall which is less uh, deep, a shallow fall and then a bounce again. But the fact is, the more realistic uh, depiction is the letter K, where those who were relatively well off have seen their income levels go up, those who were the lower end of the income strata have seen their uh, incomes crash and that really is one of the key challenges for Nirmala Sitaraman in that budget today. 23 uh, finance ministers in independent India, only uh, eight of whom have presented four budgets. This will be Nirmala Sitaraman's four, four budget. We're getting live images of uh, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman right outside North Block uh, with what is called the Bahi Khata. It used to be a leather briefcase earlier. She's flanked by uh, the economic secretaries. And uh, this move from having the traditional, very English style briefcase to the Bahi Khata uh, it's an interesting move. Oh, then your sense of the responsibilities Nirvala Sitaraman uh, carries. She's great a lot on account of uh, the pandemic and on account of how the economy has been faring. But this could be when the worst is behind us and we could see the economy recover from this whole dark shadow of the pandemic now. I hope you're right, Rahul. And uh, the signs are good for India. We've, we are in a fairly good spot in terms of macro stability. As I said, after a long time, we are seeing earnings recovering. 
and while corporate earnings are important is that once you get a virtuous cycle with corporate earnings capex starts to pick up you know through this day today you'll hear a lot rahul about what the government should do with capital expenditure to have a multiplied effect on jobs but the truth is that government capex is only two and a half percent of gdp Actually, the government is a very marginal player in the capex space. The real big elephant in that space is corporate India. When companies start to spend, that is when you will see a great economic momentum come about. So the government's role, Nirmala Sitaraman's role, is only to be an enabler. And in that, she's done quite a bit by cutting corporate taxes to 25% in, uh, a year ago. And at that, I think, has given India in the space to go out and spend on, the, uh, on a capex recovery. So I think the government's role should now be seen in the light of not doing, not focusing so much on the corporate side, but on what, as I said, the bottom end of the pyramid, because we don't have a job, uh, job situation, good job situation. We have a terrible unemployment situation and um, inflation is rising, which is hurting the poor. So I think we need a big SME package because that's where the thrust of the recovery from the government should be. So I think we need to, uh, you know, all this talk about capital gains tax and all of this. It, it's Nirmala Sitaraman there, flanked by TV Somanathan, the finance secretary and also secretary in the Department of Expenditure. You have Ajay Seth there, Department of Economic Affairs, Debashish Panda, Department of Financial Services. And Raj, the, the interesting thing is if you speak to officers in the administrative services, some of these uh, officers, like a Tarun Bajaj or a Somanathan, uh, are generally seen by their peers as being the brightest of their generation. And therefore, she does have the economic heft uh, within government for what it's worth to bring this budget together. And if you see over the pandemic where several other countries opened their purse strings, spent recklessly, India was conservative, which was criticized by many experts in, in India and internationally. But in the end, as we start emerging from this pandemic, may not have been such a bad thing to do. The jury is still out because I think at the end of the day, the income inequalities are stark. I mean, the figures show 84% of household incomes have gone down in the last two years. So I think the challenge lies, it's not an easy challenge, let's be clear. Let's not minimize the challenge that this government has faced in the last two years of the pandemic uh, in terms of reviving growth. Uh, the fact though is that we've had since 2017 first quarter a sense that the economy hasn't really taken off uh, post demonetization. And I think there are serious concerns on private uh, investment, on consumption, on stimulating demand. So there is the crisis that Uden spoke about of those at the bottom of the pyramid who are struggling because of uh, uh, unemployment, because of falling incomes. But there is also the need to stimulate private investment. And the government is in a good fiscal position. The strength is exports are good, but importantly, the fiscal situation looks good. So will the government use this budget to and push money into the economy to kickstart growth. I mean, that is the challenge uh, that Nirmala Sitaraman has. But you're right, she has a fine team of bureaucrats by all accounts with her. So there is no reason why the government cannot take advantage of the opportunity now that most of this country is vaccinated and the worst of the pandemic seems to be over. Joining us now live on India Today and Business Today's coverage of the union budget, uh, I want to introduce uh, Subhash Chandragar, former finance secretary in the Ministry of Finance, has been involved in some of the most critical uh, Modi Sarkar budgets, understands the ins and outs, the minutiae of uh, budget making. Uh, we had his insights last year, benefited immensely from them. Uh, Dr. Gar, it's a pleasure to have you back. Uh, Shankar Ayer joins us, our former colleague, author, ace, uh, economy and political analyst, always has some of the sharpest stakes in the budget. Uh, we have Saurav Majumdar with us. Uh, Saurav is the editor of Business Today magazine. Shamika Ravi joins us, Vice President of the Observer Research Foundation. She tracks the real economy as much as the financial markets and therefore has some very uh, interesting insights on what's happening out in the real world, as it were. Uh, Nikhil Kamath joins us. Nikhil is the founder and CEO of Zeroda, uh, one of the startup sensations, making a huge difference also to a lot of younger millennial investors in smaller towns coming in, participating on platforms such as his. And there's been so much talk about the India startup story, uh, Nikhil. Uh, in the build-up to this budget, and yesterday we heard from the economic survey that Delhi and not Bangalore is India's startup capital now. As somebody who represents uh, New India, as it were, what 
are the expectations that you have from this budget? What is it that you think Nirmala Sitaraman could do to propel New India into the next year? Hi, uh, I'd like to contest that and uh, continue to think that, you know, Bangalore is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Bangalore is, you know, like the heart of startups in India. Well, from, from the standpoint of our industry, uh, if I were to talk from a stock investor, trader's perspective, uh, I, I think the changes that we've been asking have been common for a while now. Uh, security transaction tax, uh, which we've been looking forward to, you know, it being rationalized in some manner. Uh, we've been asking for that for a long time. Uh, the impact cost going up while somebody is trading makes a market uh, less robust. Uh, I, I feel personally that if uh, security transaction tax was done away with, a lot more foreign capital would be attracted uh, to coming into the country and investing here. Uh, outside of that, you know, taxation on derivatives, if you're in the highest lab, uh, derivatives as a tool is very useful for people to hedge and uh, build uh, more more uh, uh, more robust portfolios when, where risk is curtailed to a large extent. Uh, reducing uh, taxation on derivatives will uh, will go a long way in helping retail investors build better portfolios. Uh, we're in the asset management space, uh, category three alternate investment funds. Uh, there is no pass through taxation like there is available in CAT one and CAT two. Uh, I think it's an again another tool which brings in a lot of capital into the equity markets. Uh, and something, uh, you know, some kind of a rationalization there will help the ecosystem as well. Uh, so, Rahul, demands are uh, plenty, but I think we all recognize what the problem is. I think uh, a very small section of society today, maybe 1% or 2% pays tax. And I, I do not know if the government has enough gunpowder just based on that uh, to bring a lot of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, kind of like, uh, changes that will probably help uh, India grow uh, faster in the next decade. Okay, Udayan uh, has a question for you, Nikhil. Just uh, yeah. let's see uh, what Udayan has for you. Yeah, Nikhil, hi, Udayan, this side. Uh, I, you know, every time a budget comes around, uh, whatever the priorities are, there is always a whiff of whether long term capital gains tax rates will go up this time or not, because that has the potential of destabilizing market sentiment. What are your thoughts on that and whether it is justified this time around on whether there is a chance that something like that might happen? Well, I have a slightly contrarian view on that. I think at the current rate, uh, you know, if you hold something for longer than 12 months, you're paying 10% uh, in surcharge. Uh, I don't think that's a hindrance to the ecosystem. Uh, when people are making a profit and, uh, you know, somebody has invested and done well in the market, I don't think they have an issue paying tax, especially at that 10%, you know, even if it were to go up to like 13, 14, 15%, I don't think would be a deal breaker. Uh, the bigger issue in my mind are, uh, you know, these indirect taxes like STT, which kind of make it more expensive for people to trade. Uh, if you look at the retail ecosystem in India today, uh, retail investors and traders uh, lose more money to STT than they do to, you know, everything else combined. I mean, like what they lose to the market, what they lose in brokerage. Uh, so I would feel like, you know, focus has to be on taxes like that, which one is paying even when he makes a profit or, you know, makes a loss, he's paying the tax. That makes the ecosystem a bit inefficient. I think we need to like do away with stuff like that if we were to be competitive on a global level and attract uh, even more capital into the country. So the challenge that... Well, we'll talk more about all of the capital markets. Sure, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Rajdeep. Uh, you know, just to go ahead with uh, what you flagged off, Udayan, at the very start, that this budget will be determined by the ability of this government to lift people at the bottom of the pyramid or give them a sense of hope. Let me go quickly around the panel to get your quick reactions to that. What would you see, like to see in the budget to, to really kickstart the economy? Shamika Ravi, why don't you start first? To give a sense to those at the bottom of the pyramid, a sense that this is not an unequal country, an unequal economy. So, Rajdeep, I expect a welfareist budget uh, this year uh, with focus on jobs. 
I think it's very clear in almost all public data sets that consumption has fallen significantly for the bottom 80%. Uh, there, in fact, 1890 or 1920, if you look at the PLFS uh, quarter to quarter uh, changes, we were actually picking up rather well. So job creation was happening at a pace, but then the pandemic has, has really uh, been devastating as far as the job market has been concerned. So I this year uh, in particular, I, I expect the budget to have a longer term view right. uh, on these structural issues rather than small time tinkering. You know, uh, uh, Shankar Ayer, yesterday when you were on my show, you seemed to suggest that the government should not go for these big bang welfare schemes. They don't know how to deal with them. But there's been talk of an urban employment guarantee scheme possibly creating uh, some kind of schemes that provide uh, relief for those at the bottom of the pyramid. Well, there's a reason why I say that is that government's delivery mechanism when it does large scale programs is very inefficient. Mm -hmm. I would rather the government transfer direct use. So here's the thing. We have a mechanism called e rupee. It is purpose specific, person specific, and it can be made extinguishable. So what if the government used e-rupee to transfer money to people to educate their children who are being pulled out of schools? What if the government transferred money for people to skill themselves, upskill themselves, reskill themselves? Fine. What if the government used that money to recompense or compensate home-owned businesses which are struggling? That's fine. But don't start another uh, umbrella program which nobody can track. So as far as the uh, urban Narega is concerned, yes, urban people have been hit. There's a large, uh, I mean, you know, the uh, poverty ratio has shifted considerably. And so what would you do? Do you have a, a roster? Do you have database on urban people? So uh, a negative tax credit like Friedman used to say may, may work. Or maybe you could transfer money through DBT to Aadhaar-based uh, uh, Jandan accounts, which are urban localities. Now, all these schemes have implementation issues. Mm -hmm. And finally, remember, Rajdeep, all of the welfare that is suggested by the government of India is undertaken by the state governments. Do the state governments have the capacity to do it? As I said yesterday, they are sitting on cash, not filling up. One-fifth of the police personnel posts are vacant. One-fifth of the teacher posts are vacant. 45 to 50,000 medical posts, or healthcare posts are vacant. Why aren't they filling it? Okay, let me, let, let's take that also to Mr. Garg. Mr. Garg, your sense, what would it take? What would you like to see? Would you like to see these big ticket welfare programs that Shamika Ravi spoke about that she expects in this budget? The government's flexibility <laughs> to undertake uh, many programs or even to expand the allocations for the welfare schemes is very limited. I think we should keep that in mind when we uh, expect the finance minister to do something. Just to give you an example, um, uh, the, uh, the biggest program for um, transfer of funds or money to uh, the poor is the Narega program, right? Uh, that would need to be uh, provided for the other program which the government runs is this Atmanirbhar um, uh, Rozgar Yojana, which is very poorly designed. It gives some uh, prudent fund assistance to uh, the people in the organized sector. The largest program which transfers money uh, to, the, uh, to the people is actually the food subsidy program, which would cost this year something like 4 lakh crores. And that, in fact, covers much of the waste uh, which happens in the in the form of the SCFCI. Just to give you an example, wheat today, uh, the economic cost is about 33 rupees a kg. Farmers are paid 20, and the rest 13 is virtually the uh, overhand and the other cost which the government has. So while the government pays 30, 33 rupees to the FCI, the people, only the farmers get benefit. Consumers actually don't get any, any benefit. If you can change this 4 lakh crore scheme 
uh, into direct transfers for farmers in the form of uh, in, instead of procurement and to the consumers instead of paying to the FCI, you can actually uh, transfer much better money uh, and much greater money to the people and create demand and, and avoid the wastage. Likewise, if you look at the remaining budget which the government has, the flexibility, maneuverability is very small. Okay. So okay. I think we should keep that in mind when we expect the government to do much more. Want to introduce now one of uh, our key force multipliers in this budget coverage, uh, the budget intelligence dashboard. And what we're able to do over here, like we do on counting day and then election, is actually track whether it is any of the sectoral spends of the government or the prime minister's pet schemes, how the allocations to different sectors uh, have moved during the budget because some of this comes through in the budget speech a lot of it isn't spoken of immediately and we'll be able to track and process that for you so that you have a sense of how uh, the numbers move but what I want to look at right now is the GDP growth number because the important thing here is the economic survey which was presented yesterday talks about growth being between 8 and 8.5 percent which is less than what the IMF projected but that's the expectation here it is between 8.8 uh, 8 to 8.5 this after 9.2 being the current estimate for how uh, the economy is growing in the current year Udayan, the important thing here for everyone to look at is not just that growth is now back to pre-pandemic levels because at some point in time that had to happen but the growth trajectory the trajectory of growth are we at the same incline that we were pre the pandemic uh, or how long it will take to be able to go from where we are to the same curve at the speed at which the Indian economy was growing before this pandemic hit us. Actually, Rahul, we had a GDP growth problem even before the pandemic uh, because Indian GDP was not growing at a very fast pace. We were getting stuck at around five and a half, six percent or just above six percent. Uh, so I think it's a fallacy to say that pre-pandemic India was roaring in terms of GDP growth. In fact, we had two or three years of a fairly uh, anemic kind of GDP growth. Uh, so not only do we have to get back to that trajectory that you're alluding to, we actually have to refine uh, the way to get back to 8% plus kind of growth. Uh, so I'll say two things to your, to your question. One is that it is important that we have a respectable GDP growth number because we need to not necessarily get 17.5% nominal GDP this time around, which was a surprise that the finance minister or the bounty which she's dealing with, but we need to get to at least a 14% kind of a nominal GDP growth, which should be the basis for strong revenue assumptions on which the budget is crafted for FY23. So that part is important. But I think all this obsession about the GDP number and whether it's 8% or 9% and whether we are the third largest and whether we're getting to 5 trillion, I think it obfuscates much of the problems. And I like to think of it this way. You know, think of a building with 10 flats. In one flat stays Mukesh Ambani, in one flat Gautam Adani, in the third flat an employee of the State Bank of India, and in the other seven flats you have people who are unemployment, struggling for jobs, or people whose incomes have been dashed by what has happened over the last couple of years. When you look at the whole building, when you ask, how is the building doing? You will say the building is doing very well, but that is completely skewed by the two occupants in those two flats. The rest of the occupants are actually doing pretty poorly. So I think that is the GDP number, the sum of all those 10 flats. But when you disaggregate that, I think underneath there is a lot of pain, which the finance minister will not be oblivious to, and she cannot be oblivious to. Sure, two green shoots that we're seeing. One tax collections continuing to be healthy. The economic survey talks about how the government has uh, headroom to be able to spend. Where should the government be spending that money? Plus, we're seeing uh, exports now at a decade high. So, uh, can that sustain? So, we have a lot to talk about as we build up to this uh, booster shot budget. Our coverage continues on the other side of a very quick break. We're back in a moment. Stay with us.